Oh, tremendous, tremendous blessing it is to be able to participate in that. I uh, pray that God uh, is speaking to you about where you are in your walk with Him. And no matter uh, where you've gone, He is still with you. Amen? No matter how far away you think you've gone, He's still with you. No matter how close you think you are, He's still with you. Amen. And He wants to continue to be with you every step of the way. I'm going to talk a little bit about baptism today and, and what the Nazarene Church uh, teaches about baptism. <clears throat> and then I'm going to talk a little bit about 2021, right? We've kicked 2020 out. We're ready for 2021, but it's not going to be any different unless you got Jesus. Amen? Amen. Well, baptism is, is one of the ways in which God interacts with his people, with his creation, right? You know, he also interacts through communion. Uh, we did that on Christmas Eve of this year. And he also interacts with us through his miraculous touch, uh, through divine healing. It's through these interactions that we find ourselves closer and closer to God. I pray that you have experienced the Holy Spirit even this morning. He makes himself very real to us. And we can begin to actually face the truth of the situations that we find ourselves in. Now, as we look at baptism today, you know, I could not, could not be happier for Kaylee as she has made this decision for her life uh, to order her life. That's one of the things that, that we talked about uh, when we were talking about uh, getting ready for baptism. To order her life around following Jesus in every area possible. And simply put, Christian baptism is a sacrament. It's a means of grace which functions as the primary sign of the new covenant for all who desire to unite themselves with Jesus Christ and with the body of Christ. Now, before we look at the actual doctrine, I want to define what a sacrament is. You might be hearing that word and saying, well, what's a sacrament? Some have said that a sacrament is an outward sign of an inward grace, something you do publicly to show what's going on inside of you. Others refer to it, as I said before, as a means of grace, meaning that somehow God's grace is given to us through this sacrament, uh, one pastor I read, Dr. Russell Metcalf, combines these ideas and, and defines the sacrament this way. He says, we use the term sacrament to signify an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace given to us, ordained by Christ himself, as a means of receiving that grace, and as a pledge or assurance of Christ's promise. From the earliest times, the sacraments have been understood by the church to be religious rites that carry the most solemn obligation of loyalty to Jesus Christ and his church. Now, each of these definitions have value, but I think a word picture might help us a little bit more today. We, we know that Jesus, God's son, came from heaven and put on human flesh. We call that the incarnation. We just celebrated that during this Advent and Christmas Eve, Christmas morning. And, and we call it the incarnation, God with us. Uh, Emmanuel means God with us. And Jesus took the natural body and he infused it with his own presence. And it became then supernatural, right? I watched Wonder Woman 84 this, this last uh, couple days, right? And God is better, right? His supernatural power is better, right? It was really not very good movie. So, uh, God is better. The ordinary becomes extra ordinary. Amen? Isn't that cool? When we take ordinary things and God puts himself into it, it becomes extra ordinary, extraordinary. And in many ways, the sacraments, baptism, communion, they are like the incarnation. There are simple, tangible elements. We can touch these things. Bread, juice, water. We, they have no value of their own. And they are combined with God's prayer. And when they are combined with God's presence in worship, and the ordinary then becomes extraordinary. Amen. The natural becomes supernatural. And the, the mundane becomes heavenly. These means of grace become the ordinary means by which we meet the extra, extraordinary God. Now, I want to be clear right now that baptism doesn't uh, save you any more than communion sustains you. It is always and only God's grace which saves, sustains, sanctifies, and glorifies. Amen. 
The sacraments are, are the God-ordained, ordinary means by which this grace is given to me and to you. And it's how we experience God's grace. Now, I didn't say it's the only means. Is God can give grace, His unmerited favor, any way that He wants to. And we cannot assume that we can control God through the sacraments and force His grace on us. So we understand that baptism and communion are the ordinary means by which God gives us extraordinary grace. Now, I do want to look, take a look at the Nazarene article of faith on baptism in just a moment. And I will give us a few questions then uh, and try to answer them from the, the basis and the grounds of Scripture. But uh, John Wesley, who kind of uh, founded um, the Methodist, this church and then the Nazarene church is an offshoot of that. He would use these four elements in determining how he decided things. Call them the Wesleyan quadrilateral. quadrilateral uh, scripture, tradition, reason, and experience, right? So these are the four elements where we make our decisions in scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. And we've got to make sure we order those correctly. Scripture has to be number one. Tradition we base our decisions off the history of the church, of the people that have come before us and have done a lot of the hard work to help us in our understanding today. Reason, we can think God gave us a brain, we might as well use it, right? Husbands and wives, stop looking at each other, okay? <laughs> and then experience. We have to be able to experience God somehow in some way. Otherwise, it's just a, a mind game. It has to be real to us. Amen? Amen? We have to experience it. So let's look at what the Nazarene Church says about baptism. It says, We believe that Christian baptism commanded by our Lord is a sacrament signifying acceptance of the benefits of the atonement of Jesus Christ to be administered to believers and declarative of their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior and full purpose of obedience and holiness and righteousness. Baptism being a symbol of the new covenant, young children may be baptized upon request of parents or guardians who shall give assurance for them of necessary Christian training. Baptism may be administered by sprinkling, pouring, or immersion according to the choice of the applicant. Now, I want to look at some of the most common questions that come up in regards to baptism in the Church of Nazarene. If you have a question that I don't address today, please uh, give me a call, email me, uh, come talk to me. That'd be, that'd be great. First question is, does baptism save you? I've kind of already answered that earlier, but the answer is no. Baptism in and of itself does not save you. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says this, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Baptism is just something that someone who is already saved does, right? And it's the call of Jesus to do that, we have to always remember that the biggest factor in our salvation, why we are saved, why we're even able to be saved, or to even know that we need to be saved, is God's grace. Amen? It is His grace by which we are saved. This grace is given to us through our faith, but even that faith is a gift of God so that no one can boast. Baptism does not save you. Church membership does not save you. Not even repeating the sinner's prayer saves you. We are saved only by God's grace through our faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. And we partner with Him in the suffering that comes in that. Next question, why, why then should we be baptized? If it doesn't save us, why should we be baptized? Well, each believer should be baptized because Jesus set the example for us in Matthew chapter 3 and later commanded that the church be his witnesses in all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You can read that in Matthew chapter 28. We are baptized because we want to be faithful in obeying Jesus' call for us to be baptized. We can't just ignore it. Jesus said, repent and be baptized. We need to be baptized. What is the purpose, then, of baptism? Next question, what is the purpose of baptism? Baptism is the sacrament most closely associated as the initiation into the body of Christ. 
Just like circumcision was the conversion ceremony rite in the Old Covenant, Old Testament, baby boys had to be circumcised. Baptism is the sign and seal of the New Covenant, of Jesus shed blood, him dying on the cross, raising back to life and bringing us new life. That's the covenant promise between us and God. Baptism is the sign of being a part of that covenant. It represents the washing away of our sin. Not just covering our sin, washing it away. Amen? Amen. Like, that's cool. We stand before God righteous. Not just because Jesus' blood covers us, it's washed away our sins. The sprinkling clean of our hearts, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Now, as a sacrament, we understand it to be ordinary, but not the only means by which justifying grace is given to the believer and prevenient grace is given to the infant. The ordinary water accomplishes something extraordinary in our lives as we are washed clean and brought into the body of Jesus Christ. If you have never been baptized, what should you do? You might be asking yourself that. If I've never been baptized, what should I do? You should be obedient to what Christ has asked you to do. If you've already expressed faith in God's saving work on the cross and in your heart, then baptism is the logical next step. If you have not yet found that faith in Jesus Christ, I want to urge you to seek forgiveness for your sins, to repent of your sins, and enter into a right relationship with God. Jesus died on the cross for your sins and for my sins so that you could be forgiven and washed clean. Once you have settled that question, do not delay in being baptized to make public your entrance into the body of Christ, to make sure the world knows you have entered into that covenant with God, and to encounter the supernatural through natural water. If any of you feel the Lord calling you to follow Him in obedience uh, in regard to baptism, do not delay. You can talk to me later today. You can send me a message anytime. It would be so awesome. Right? To welcome you into the body of Christ, the body of Christ in this way. And all I ask is that you be obedient to God. If you've come to a saving knowledge of Jesus as your Savior and you have not yet been obedient in this way, now is the time to affirm your faith and your dependence on God's grace. Now, I want to take just a few moments today to talk about what I think is possible for us in 2021. Those of you that are here, if you're watching online, welcome. I, I should have said that earlier, but we've got so much that we can do in 2021. And I said last week that if anyone thinks just turning the calendar over from December 31st of 2020 to January 1st of 2020, 20, of 2021 will make uh, some magical difference in your life, just turning that calendar over, you're crazy. <laughs> the only thing that will make any real difference in your life is knowing Jesus Christ in such a way to know that, that He has died on the cross for your sins and that yet you are now living in a way that follows His Lordship. He's Savior. He has saved us. But we need to live under the fact that He is Lord. Amen? Amen. He determines how we live. We as Christians are called to be Disciples of Jesus. That means, as disciples, we do what He does. We do what He did. Not just, um, uh, it's not just, uh, oh, I've got to put my notes, sorry. Not what we think He wants us to do, because how you are smart enough to, to just know what God wants you to do all the time? Good job. Okay? No one, no one is smart enough to just know what God wants us to do. We have to follow our master. We have to follow the one who leads us. That's what makes us disciples. Not just saying, I think this is what I need to do. This is what God would want me to do. But actually having it in the word. Being led by the spirit as you read his word. And saying, okay, this is the way I will go. Because that's the way that Jesus is going. We do what he does. So much of our lives are spent just going from one event to the next. From one disaster to the next. Working out how to just make it through that day. Here's, here's what I've learned. For my life, and I think it's true for everybody. 
Jesus wants so much more for us. Amen? Amen? He wants more than just get through this thing. Now get through this thing. Now get through this thing. He wants more for He wants us to have abundant life. But when our focus is on anything but Him, we simply cannot accomplish that better life that He wants for each and every one of us. It is only through making the choice to live for Jesus, doing what He did for God first, uh, for others second, and for ourselves last, that we can possibly know the freedom He can give for us. So what are some things that you need to start doing in order to experience that kind of freedom? Well, first, you must believe fully that God is true. Jesus is true. The Word of God is true. And then live like it tells all of us to live. There are many people missing out on the fullness of God because they simply choose to ignore what the Bible says. I hope you understand that what the Bible says is actually the words of God. Amen? Amen. Come on. God has given us the words of life. The best plan for any life is laid out in the scriptures. We have a, a Bible reading plan on the, on the table in the back. And if you need help figuring out how to read through the Bible, that's a pretty simple one to follow. If you have any questions or want to do a different one, come and talk to me. But you've got to be in the Word and believe that what it says is true and then live like it says to live. Second, you need to confess the sins of your life to God and repent of them. Walk away. Confession is easy. Repentance is hard. We are a forgiving people, and so confessing kind of becomes easy. Oh, absolutely, I forgive you. I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm going to forgive you. Absolutely. But now you have to then walk away from what it is you just ask for forgiveness from. You actually have to stop sinning. Yeah. Right? And we can we can choose to live in a way that follows Jesus Christ with every decision of our lives. And this is something that needs to happen every time that you know you've walked away from following Jesus. And while this, this act of confession and repentance is a big deal, we need to get used to living a life of confession and repentance. When I have a poor attitude, or I find myself acting in a way that I know goes against the will of God, I have to stop, confess, and repent. It is so simple, and yet difficult. No one likes to confess their faults and flaws. No one likes to admit that they didn't need to fly off the handle yesterday. No one wants to share or take blame of a situation, especially if we can get someone else to take that blame. Somehow we think we're justified in that. It is time for Christians to be actual Christ followers and believe what the Bible says and do it. Our absolute best witness comes when we act like Jesus and it looks crazy to the world. That could put us on a lonely island sometimes, I'll be honest. But as our, our team quizzers have learned this year studying the book of Matthew, it is far better to repent than to ignore the calls of Jesus Christ. A third, I think we are living in a day and age when we have so much excess. We need to learn, I need to learn, what it is to give up things that might not be bad by themselves, but are taking us away from the fullness of life found in following Jesus. Another lesson our, our team quizzers have learned is that it is better to cut off our hands or, or gouge out our eyes than to be in danger of the fires of hell. Like the Bible really says that. We need to make sure we believe that it's actually better to go into heaven with one less hand or no eyes than to walk into the pits of hell. Amen? We need to believe that. The th what things are keeping you from experiencing everything that Jesus might have for you? Is it, is it the TV or, or your phone? Is, is it food? Is it alcohol or, or drugs? Even prescription drugs? What is it that's keeping you from Jesus? Do you have some sort of fantasy 
that you think about all the time, uh, maybe you can't sit quietly for an extended amount of time. You constantly have to be doing something or reading something or watching something. And, and what I've found is to be true, and especially in the last couple of months, is I'm becoming more and more convinced that we need quiet time in order to meet with Jesus best. What do you need to give up so that you can start the practice of quiet time with Jesus? I think that we need to recognize that this is the only life we get, right? This is the only life you've got. While we may think that that means then we should be able to do whatever we want, I want to propose to you that the best thing you can do with your life today is to do the things that Jesus does and the things that Jesus did as recorded in Scripture. We think about Jesus, we talk about Jesus, we love people like Jesus, and then everything else will fall into place. Everything else will find its proper order in your life. But you have to make Jesus everything. All other things are nothing if Jesus is not actually everything in your life. If there is something that you cannot give up, Jesus is not the Lord of your life. For Grace Point, Church of the Nazarene in 2021, I want each and one of us to do all of those things want us to do those things together. We need each other. I need you, you need me, and all of the other people. I'm not going to sing the Barney song. But I always do. <laughs> we are we are stuck with each other. I'm sorry. Okay, We're stuck with each other. We need each other. Now let me finish uh, Scripture from Acts chapter 2. Now the Holy Spirit had just come on the believers at Pentecost. Peter had preached a wonderful sermon to the crowd. And after the crowd heard this message from Peter, after they thought about the message and reflected about the message, here is their response. When people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. How cool of a story is that? Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. I think that's probably something that has been able to have been said since that day that Peter preached that message. But that doesn't make it less true for us now. Save yourselves. Repent and be baptized. I would love to talk with any of you about that at any point in time. Now, let us see. We're going to worship here in just a second, but I want to leave you with these words. Let us seek every day to be faithful, re faithfully responsive to God's grace and work in our lives. May we continue to seek His cleansing and filling that we can be more and more formed into His image, moment by moment, day by day. Amen. Heavenly Father, bless these words. Bless the reading of your word. And as we worship you this morning, that you would just pour out your grace on us, that we might experience the wonder of your love and your mercy. Father God, that we would desire more and more to be formed into your image. Thank you, Father, for Jesus, for your love, for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.